Okay, let's get started. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fahim. I'm with Webit Solutions. I'll be covering this particular uh, session. Um, so, basically, it's a webinar uh, on uh, microservices, um, logging, tracing, uh, load balancing, and auto failover by using various technologies and so on. Uh, so before we start off the session, uh, I would like to ask you guys to please raise your hand in this uh, Zoom software. This way I'll be able to verify you can hear me. So in our Zoom software, uh, please look at uh, raise hand option and then uh, click it, okay. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, so uh, if you guys have any questions, you can type them in the questions box. I'll most likely answer the questions at the end of the session. Um, otherwise, if uh, the question is relevant to the topic which I'm covering at, at a given time, I'll try to answer it right away. Otherwise, it will most likely be at the end of the session. Okay, uh, so you guys will uh, be able to see the recorded uh, video um, as well as uh, the PDF file for the slides will be uploaded as well later on. Uh, so you'll be able to get both the video as well as uh, the PDF file. Um, okay, uh, then um, on my side, I'll show you quite a few concepts. I'll show you some demos on my site where necessary, where uh, it's uh, sufficient. I'll just show you uh, a recorded video of that session, uh, especially when it's a very time consuming sort of demo. I'll show you a, a pre-recorded video. So you'll be able to uh, see the entire end-to-end -end process when we have to, let's say, implement load balancing, et cetera, and so on. Okay, so let's start off uh, with the session. So uh, like I mentioned, today's agenda is we will discuss uh, what exactly microservices are. Then we will discuss how we can implement uh, auto failover, load balancing, uh, how we can utilize uh, various tools to implement logging, tracing, uh, monitoring, et cetera, can be implemented as well, and so on. So it's all about uh, these things. Then uh, let's start off with the microservices. So just so that everyone is on the same page, uh, let's first of all talk about what exactly microservices are. Uh, or overall, we also use the term microservices architecture. So what exactly this architecture is, how we usually design or develop our applications, and how we can uh, implement uh, load balancing, auto failover, uh, implement uh, tracing, monitoring, et cetera, and so on by using various tools. So microservices, they are basically uh, small autonomous services that work together. So overall, we say that we take a monolithic, a traditional enterprise application, and we break it down into multiple smaller pieces, multiple smaller components. And uh, then usually we get to utilize REST services a lot in order to ensure that the microservices are able to communicate with each other. So they are overall multiple small components. Um, unlike the traditional architecture, in case of microservices, we get to use JSON or the JSON, however you want to pronounce it, it's a JavaScript object notation. We use this as the data interchange format. And um, it allows us to easily integrate multiple services because when you use the web standards such as JSON, you also get to utilize HTTP protocol or HTTPS depending on your requirement. And uh, we prefer using REST services. So they make it easy enough for multiple small services to communicate with each other. And overall, they are very lightweight as well compared to the traditional architecture, uh, which is also usually known as uh, SOA, service-oriented architecture, where we usually rely a lot on SOAP, XML sort of uh, protocols and uh, data interchange format and so on. And they're usually very heavyweight as well. So in case if you guys are already familiar with microservices, this is just a quick overview or sort of a refresher. But uh, those guys who are not currently using microservices, let me discuss this in slightly more detail, like what a traditional application usually looks like and how we can split it into uh, multiple smaller services, or in other words, we can say how we can implement microservices architecture. So to understand microservices architecture, uh, let's first of all try to look at what a traditional application usually looks like. So in a typical application, when you use the traditional architecture, you will uh, use some web, web server or uh, uh, to be more precise, some application server, like let's say Tomcat, WebLogic, WebSphere, uh, JBoss, et cetera, and so on. So you'll get to utilize various uh, uh, servers, application servers and so on. Uh, 
there's a quick question. Does it mean SOAP services? Oh, so uh, good point. So there's a question. Can SOAP services be utilized or treated as microservices or not? You can. Definitely you can utilize SOAP uh, XML sort of services as well to implement microservices architecture, but overall they will still remain very heavyweight compared to using the lightweight option which is provided by REST services. So REST services is becoming the de facto uh, or the industry standard when it comes to implementing microservices. And usually SOAP XML is uh, associated with the traditional uh, monolithic heavyweight sort of architecture. But it doesn't mean that it's not possible to use SOAP XML services to implement a microservices sort of application. You can still do that. Definitely you can do that. But uh, you just have to keep in mind that overall uh, the performance of your REST services will definitely be far more superior than SOAP XML based services. So if uh, you're okay with having slightly slow performance, then definitely you can use SOAP XML services. What you can do is you can uh, break down your existing enterprise application into multiple smaller components and still use SOAP XML if you want. So definitely you can do that. Uh, so technically it is possible. It's just that when we say we want to go for the modern approach, then we try to use uh, REST services over SOAP XML services. Like even here, when I explain this diagram to you guys in just a bit, I'll uh, mention that you can use these by utilizing SOAP XML services as well. So a traditional enterprise application would have some uh, application server like Tomcat, WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss, etc., and you will host your entire application, which will be composed of the user interface layer. Uh, you will have uh, the backend as well, uh, like you will have the uh, server side portion of your application, which can be written in Java, .NET, PHP, Ruby, Node.js, or, or sorry, Node.js will be primarily, or, or, or actually, yes, it's a server side uh, application, so it can be used on the server side. So it can be any type of application running on the server side. Um, and um, your entire application will be available here, which means that, say if we have a WAR file in case of a Java-based application, you will have the user interface and pretty much everything available in this uh, particular WAR file you can choose to break it down into multiple smaller jar files as well, for sure, but it will be hosted on the same Tomcat application server. So say you're working on ERT, enterprise resource planning sort of uh, solution. You will have sales, marketing, inventory, general ledger, payroll, uh, et cetera, and so on. So all of them will be hosted on the same application server. So when everything is hosted on the same application server, Usually this is associated uh, with the traditional enterprise application sort of architecture uh, where we focus on just one primary application server which hosts everything, one primary database server which hosts the data for all the applications and so on. So this is considered as a monolithic sort of architecture. It's a monolith in short. So uh, microservices, says that we should split it into multiple small uh, components uh, that should run in separate containers, which I'll talk about in just a bit. So this is basically a traditional enterprise application. And uh, the major drawback of this architecture is that your release cycles will be fairly long because usually in case of enterprise uh, applications, uh, you have to focus on multiple components. You have to deploy all the components in sort of a single go, uh, and often it can reset your uh, server as well, unless you implement load balancing and other techniques and so on. It can result in your downtime of that application uh, and because it's primarily using the same server basically and so on. Um, so basically, a single machine will end up hosting all of your applications like this and uh, a single machine will end up hosting uh, all the data, the, uh, whatever databases are required, they will be all hosted on the same database server which will be running on the same machine and so on. This is basically your traditional enterprise architecture. Um, if you compare it to microservices architecture, we basically break it down into multiple smaller, loosely coupled sort of uh, services. 
we heavily focus on services that are loosely coupled uh, mostly they are independent of each other as far as technology is concerned and they'll be running in separate in most cases we get to use docker container basically so docker container is a, uh, one of the technologies which allows you to isolate these small components so uh, what's the meaning of isolation i'll talk about that in just a bit but in short you will notice that isolation is a lot about ensuring that the technology should be independent of other uh, components so a technology of a component it should be independent of the technologies which you have used for other components and so on so for example if you have the erp scenario or here for now i have this uh, uh, online order management system sort of scenario here we have let's say account portion of our application so this will be running in a separate isolated area which we usually create by using docker technology which allows us to create docker containers so a container is containment of an application small piece of an application so account portion of the application is hosted here in this container so the process whatever technology you have used to write the services like uh, you could have used java you can use a uh, spring boot with java you can utilize a uh, .net framework you can use uh, node.js php etc and so on so that will be running in this particular container i'll talk about data in just a bit for now just know that at least the process at least the services they are contained like this in separate isolated containers and since this, these are isolated containers what it means is that technology wise they can use various technologies you can implement account service in dotnet framework you can implement product catalog service in node.js you can implement cart server in java with spring boot so you can use a different technology for each service whereas in case of let's say traditional architecture usually we pick just one technology and we implement all our applications by using that same technology uh, especially when we have to host all of them on the same server like in case of tomcat you cannot use dotnet framework it's not even a choice now you have to use java so basically uh, you sort of limit yourself when you go for enterprise architecture because you're thinking in terms of uh, we need to have a database server we need to have an application server whereas in case of microservices it gives us more freedom because each component can be running in a, or it should be running in a separate container and each container can utilize a totally different technology a totally different language and that is where we get to use um, this uh, term polyglot so polyglot services are multi language sort of services so each service can be developed in a different service and uh, containers will ensure that they are isolated from each other they are self contained sort of services so overall they don't need to know what technology has been used to uh, write the uh, other services and so on all they need to know is where exactly they are available what are their end points so just like in uh, soa uh, the traditional soap xml services we use the term endpoint there as well likewise here we basically have to ensure that these rest services are exposed so overall rest services uh, they will just have a url like for example you will have http you will have some machine name for now i'm just being lazy just using a local host you will have port number you will have api uh, quite often we use api as part of the url this way we will know that this is not just a simple web page it a rest service which we have to access by using this specific url so say we want to access product service so that will be the url uh, of our product service and then we get to use uh, method so method is um, a, a web standard it has been existing since forever uh, so we get to use get for retrieve purpose we get to use this post mostly for insert purpose we get to use put for update or delete for deleting a record and so on so all these rest services will basically be exposed uh, like this they will have a url they will have some method associated to the url this way uh, when a product service receives a put request it will know it has to update the records and it also has to uh, utilize body so as part of the http body or the message body we have to uh, send some uh, payload and that's usually just not javascript object rotation 
and definitely if you are using SOAP XML services, definitely you can utilize traditional uh, technique, like you can have some URL, uh, whatever port number you have, whatever the service name you have, and then uh, you'll most likely have some extension like ASMX or something like that and so on, it's up to you. That will tell you, know, uh, it will let you know that it's a, a traditional uh, SOAP XML service and as part of your uh, body, HTTP or uh, the uh, body of your uh, uh, SOAP XML itself, you have to send uh, Dead in XML format and so on. So sure, it's technically possible to use SOAP XML services and ensure that these services are exposed. So you can uh, still develop your applications in different technologies like uh, .NET Framework, Node.js, uh, Java, etc. And you can do SOAP XML to ensure that these services or uh, components are able to connect to each other. But uh, REST services is becoming a more de facto. So uh, sort of uh, technology or the step when it comes to uh, creating microservices because they are faster. Uh, and actually, I don't want to confuse you guys, but there's something else as well called gRPC. You guys can Google for it. It's uh, yet another te technique which actually can be used to replace even REST services, which can make, make things up to 25 times faster. Not percent faster, but times faster. It's actually the fastest uh, known way of um, uh, communicating with other services and so on. So definitely uh, you can use SOAP XML services if you want, but REST services currently they are more popular. Okay, so basically you have these uh, services written in different technologies and they will be hosted inside containers in Docker containers, which allows us to isolate certain application from other applications and so on. And uh, data-wise, uh, you can definitely choose to have the database inside the container as well. Like accounts can have its own database, product can have its own database and so on. Definitely you can do it like this. But keep in mind that the data should not ideally be there inside the container. The process, the binaries of your database server, they should be inside the container, but not the data itself. So for example, if you're using account service, it's uh, developed in let's say uh, Java, and uh, for database, you have opted to go for let's say SQL Server, which is now cross-platform. It works on Linux, Mac, as well as Windows. Uh, so you can definitely use SQL uh, with this one. Uh, and let's say for uh, third catalog, you have opted to go for Node.js, and uh, you have opted to go for some no SQL sort of database like MongoDB. So definitely you can have a mix of these databases, but only the binaries should be inside the container, not the actual data, because containers, uh, later on we'll talk about this in more detail as well, that uh, they, uh, when we have to, let's say, implement continuous integration and continuous delivery, CICD, usually we have to destroy the old containers and we have to create new containers. So when you destroy an old container, you will lose the process, the boundaries, which is okay, but you will also lose the data as well. So ideally data should be outside the containers, not inside the container. The data should be more persistent. So for that, usually we get to use something called shared volume, which is supported by Docker, which uh, ensures that uh, data should be outside the container. So this way, if you have to destroy a container or restart a container, it should not uh, lose any data at all. So just the bind Boundaries of your uh, database servers, like uh, NoSQL uh, or like MongoDB, SQL Server sort of binaries, they can be inside the container, but not the actual data itself. So basically, containment of application and the data, that will ensure that you have multiple small uh, self-contained sort of services. So here we are saying that account is one of the services, which will be composed of multiple let's say REST services or SOAP XML sort of services and so on. I, uh, it can also have some web user interface sort of code as well, but usually user interface code is often utilized or uh, stored in a separate container. But definitely you can choose to have the user interface along with the REST services or SOAP XML services inside the same container as well. And uh, just the data is kept outside the container so that if we have to implement CI CD, which will destroy the old container, then it should not uh, result in any data loss at all. 
So basically, uh, this is a quick overview of microservices concept that we prefer having multiple small self-contained services. And uh, in order to make sure that they're able to communicate with each other, we prefer using REST services. Otherwise, definitely you can go for SOAP XML services as well. And uh, like I pointed out that GRTC is yet another way which you can use uh, in order to make sure that services are able to communicate with each other at a very fast pace. So microservices, they ensure that we implement a business domain-centric design. This is a microservices architecture where we have ordered service, shipping service, catalog service. An ordered service will definitely be uh, a sort of a self-contained sort of service in a sense that it will contain the process, like uh, all the services, uh, and also the database portion as well, like uh, the database boundaries and so on. So that will be in the ordered uh, microservice. Um, and ideally, we should use Docker container to self-contain these things. And uh, in order to make sure that these are able to communicate with each other, we have to use a REST service or SOAP XML service, or you can use gRPC as well if you want. Whereas in enterprise or the traditional enterprise uh, architecture or applications, we think in terms of this is our application server, this is our web server, this is our database server. And everything that's part of your database server will be on the same server. Everything that's part of your uh, application server will be on the same server. Whereas here we prefer having multiple small self-contained sort of services, which means that if you are using, let's say Java, with let's say Spring Boot, if you guys already use Spring Boot, you must have noticed that when you use, let's say, uh, any uh, uh, run uh, any uh, build engine, like let's say Maven, you can use, let's say, Maven clean install Spring Boot dash run. So this automatically starts up a built-in application server, which is supported by Spring Boot. So Spring Boot out of the box, it, it's uh, utilizing uh, a Tomcat based uh, application server and it hosts the application automatically. Likewise, if you're using, let's say Node.js, Node.js also has its own built-in application server. Likewise, uh, .NET framework, uh, when you use, let's say .NET core, you can use a .NET uh, build to build the application and .NET run it starts, starts up its own built-in application server. So these are self-contained sort of technologies in a sense that they're able to run on their own. They have all the necessary stuff in them. So this way, each container will be running a separate technology, sort of a separate application server where the application is hosted. So this is a more preferred approach in a microservices architecture, rather than saying that, no, we, we should have exactly one web logic server. Every possible application should go to, on the same server. It should be part of the same web, uh, web logic or web sphere sort of application servers and so on. So we prefer having multiple small uh, isolated sort of containers where technology is not really depending on the technology of other uh, components or other services and so on. So all these are mostly independent of each other. The only dependency we have here is the URLs, uh, REST services, uh, or SOAP XML sort of service sort of URLs and so on. We just need to know these URLs to communicate with other services basically. So this way, uh, the major benefit you will get out of microservices architecture would be, you can use various technologies, various uh, programming languages, to write these uh, components uh, in future, you can swap out the technology with some other technology. And as long as the URLs, which you have used, uh, they remain the same, uh, sorry, they remain the same, then other services will be able to communicate uh, with your REST service and so on, or uh, whatever service you are using. It can be SOAP XML as well, definitely. So basically, uh, main thing is to make sure that these are able to communicate with each other, rather than saying that, no, they must use web logic. They must use web sphere they must use Java. So we don't want to limit ourselves as far as technologies are concerned and so on. So it's a technology independent sort of technique. You can use any technology to implement microservices. And uh, another benefit would be that you will be able to have multiple small teams working on these projects. And you do not have to ensure that they all know the exact same technology. So multiple small teams can work on these uh, projects.
secrets regardless of the technology uh, because this can be written in Node.js. You can uh, get a few developers that are good in Node.js. They can develop this microservice. Uh, uh, other developers who are good uh, in, let's say, Java, they can develop this shipping service, etc., and so on. And uh, likewise, even the database, like I pointed out that uh, the binaries of the database can also be contained inside the same container, or you can uh, still choose to create a separate container if you want, but this is one of the common strategies. Uh, still, if you want to make things a bit more sort of uh, traditional, the way we usually do in regular or a traditional architecture, you can still do something like this. Where is my one node? Okay, so here you can uh, say that we have database part. So we can have just one database running in a different container or it can be outside a container as well. You can have a regular Oracle SQL Server sort of database server and uh, just the services, just the REST services or SOAP XML sort of services or just the process, just the process part is running inside a container and they're talk, talking to the exact same database. So that is possible as well, but that will be sort of a, a semi-microservices sort of architecture. A true proper microservices architecture should ideally have the process of the database as well contained in a container. Okay, so basically this is a microservices architecture and a process wise we have talked about uh, uh, this important uh, benefit that you will no longer be limiting yourself to a specific technology or to a specific database server, uh, et cetera, and so on. And uh, this will basically help you a lot uh, when you are trying to implement CI, CD, because you'll be able to update these components independently of other components. You do not have to update all of them at the same time in most cases, uh, like they will not affect uh, the entire application, like uh, usually in case of traditional architecture, uh, since everything is usually hosted on the same server, so if you are, let's say, performing patch management, et cetera, and so on, at times, you have to shut down the entire server before uh, you'll be able to run the applications again and make them available to your uh, end users and so on. Whereas here, since they are running in separate containers, so you'll be able to update them uh, one at a time without affecting other applications and so on. So in most cases, you will be able to update uh, these at different time intervals rather than doing, um, updating them at the same time and so on. Okay, so uh, keeping this in mind that uh, microservices architecture encourages us to think in terms of business domain-centric design, like think of uh, what services you want to have, then each service should be a Docker container, ideally. And uh, each container will have uh, the process, the, like the REST services or the SOAP XML services. Uh, it can contain the binaries of your database server as well and so on. So you think in, ter in terms of your services, rather than in terms of, no, we must have this database server, we must have this application server, now we have to deploy our business entities here and so on. So keeping this in mind, let's cover microservices in more detail. So slowly and gradually, we are going to talk about uh, load balancing, failover. I'll uh, show you this practically as well. Uh, and I'll also talk about tracing and monitoring. For that, we will use uh, various tools. But before we see this, uh, these things practically, let's uh, talk about another very important concept, which is called service mesh. When we implement microservices, quite often we use this term service mesh as well. A service mesh is basically a collection of multiple microservices that create your final application. So you will have your application broken down into multiple smaller microservices, which we have discussed previously as well. But often a service mesh should support these features or functionalities as well. Like there should be service discovery feature. We should be able to discover the services. Uh, one service should be able to talk to some other service. Uh, they should be exposed basically. Uh, for that, we usually get to configure routes. Uh, I'll talk about how we can use Docker Kubernetes to ensure that a service is discoverable in just a bit. 
And then a uh, service mesh should also support load balancing, which is uh, one of the primary topics of this particular session. I'll uh, show you practically how we can implement load balancing uh, as well as uh, failover. So load balancing means uh, when you have a service, let's say it's a uh, product service. Now, if, you, if uh, way too many users are trying to connect to the service at the same time, then uh, definitely the performance will not be very good. So to ensure that the performance is not affected, what we do is we contain the service in a Docker container, but we spin off, we start up multiple identical Docker containers. So we create multiple replicas basically that are identical. And then uh, due to service mesh concept, what will happen is that uh, the users will be redirected to an appropriate instance. So load balancer will ensure that it connects to the appropriate instance, which has less load on it. So load balancing, I'll show you this practically in just a bit. Uh, failover is yet another thing which I'll show you practically in just a bit, but in short, when you have multiple replicas, if one of them has crashed, then the alternate instance should become the active instance automatically and uh, th there should be no dis disruption of the service at all. People should remain connected to your application. The traffic should be rerouted to some alternate service, which is still up and running. And replicas wise, you can actually define as many replicas as you want. De definitely the more replicas you have, the more resources you require as well. But in uh, general, you can specify uh, multiple replicas. Uh, and uh, what will happen is that if one instance has crashed where your service was running, due to this failover recovery concept, even though this has crashed and the traffic is now redirected to other instance, which is still up and running, uh, it will still bring this one up and running. It will bring it online again. Not the exact same instance which crashed, it will just spin off or start up another replica it will create another replica automatically so that you always have a uh, fixed number of uh, services running at a given time. So you fix the number of uh, services or uh, the instances uh, when you configure your service mesh and so on. So in just a bit, I'll uh, show you how we can use um, a technology called Kubernetes. So Kubernetes allows you to start up multiple identical replicas and you specify how many uh, replicas you want to have at a given time and it will ensure that it always keeps that many replicas active or uh, available at a given time. Okay, so I'll show you these things practically, but before that, let's quickly talk about uh, some more things. Uh, later on, I'll talk about monitoring metrics in detail, but in short, it's about monitoring or uh, checking uh, various metrics, like for example, your performance metrics. Uh, your CPU utilization, uh, the number of times you have access the service, etc. cetera, uh, whether you had any failed requests or not, uh, you want to see the status of your services and so on. So you want to monitor your REST services or any type of service, like even SOAP XML sort of service and so on, which is running in these isolated containers. So uh, in order to implement load balancing and failover, we use Kubernetes in order to implement monitoring and metrics, we can use various options, but one of the most popular options these days is Prometheus. So I'll show you this practically in just a bit. Prometheus is very useful for monitoring and uh, gathering metrics. And uh, tr uh, you'll also want to ensure that you log messages, you trace messages. So for tracing and logging, we get to use uh, a tool called Jaeger. I'll show you this one as well, practically in just a bit. But in short, service mesh, it does include lots of uh, features. Uh, so whenever you implement a proper service mesh, these should be supported. But for now, we're just going to focus on these features. Uh, but uh, just know that we can also utilize rate limiting, which means that uh, if uh, some person from outside the organization is trying to connect to your service a lot, uh, then you'll want to limit the uh, 
the access basically or if let's say uh, you have a circuit breaker sort of requirement you want to ensure that if some service is down if people are trying to connect to that particular service over and over again then rather than literally connecting to that service and check whether it's up and running or not you limit the rate for for that you implement circuit breaker so that you do not always connect to that uh, service which is down and so on uh, so basically we can uh, implement lots of things uh, can we release this basically means that uh, you want to ensure that uh, the newly developed features are handed over to very, uh, very few end users so that they can test the application and in case if there is any issue it should not affect a uh, majority of the users it should only affect a small group of users and so on so we have various options that are available to us when we implement a proper service mesh but in this particular session we will only focus on uh, mostly the load balancing failover monitoring metrics and uh, tracing and for that we will utilize kubernetes prometheus and jaeger tools okay so a proper microservice architecture should ideally support most of these service mesh uh, functionalities or features and so on. So let's uh, first of all talk about a bit of uh, Docker because in just a bit I want to show you Kubernetes practically. So if uh, you guys are already using Kubernetes, well and good. Those guys who are not using Kubernetes, we need to have a brief overview of the uh, prerequisites before we'll be able to understand Kubernetes. So before we discuss Kubernetes, let's have a quick overview of Docker and its role in implementing microservices. Uh, so if you recall, we discussed previously that uh, ideally in a microservices architecture based application, we should have multiple small isolated self-contained sort of services. And uh, they should be running inside a container. Each service should be running inside a separate container. This is basically your Docker container. So Docker is the technology which allows us to self-contain these applications. Self-contain means sort of portable applications. So portable means that everything that is required by that particular application should be in, in the same container. And that's way you'll be able to take the container and just copy it over to some other environment or some other machine. Like it can be a physical machine, it can be a virtual machine, it can be uh, cloud like Azure, AWS, GCP, etc., as well, and it should run as it is there as well, without worrying about oh, where are my dependencies? Do I need to copy some of the entries from uh, operating system registry? Do I need to copy some files that are available in a different folder? So we should not have to worry about these dependencies, etc., at all. All the dependencies should be available in inside the container itself. So that's why we use the term self-contained. Everything, uh, everything that's required to run that portion of the application should be there. It should be part of that particular container. So Docker is a, a very commonly used technology which allows us to contain the applications. So this way you can have peace of mind that you never have to worry about some other folder or some other file which resides outside your application uh, structure, etc., and so on. So Docker is a very, very important technology when it comes to implementing microservices. Uh, here, uh, I will not discuss this uh, in great detail because we already have had quite a few sessions on Docker portion in the past along with Kubernetes as well. So I'll just give you a brief overview for now. So Docker, uh, usually in the real world, we get to write a script, a file, uh, and the file name is Docker file with capital D. And there we specify what Docker image we want to use. So image wise, we can say that we want to use one of the custom images or we want to use some off the shelf sort of image. Uh, you can see uh, most of these images by going to Docker um, official website, which is hub.docker.com. There you can see various images. So for example, here we want to use an image which already has JDK 8 pre-installed. And then here we are uh, creating a custom folder inside the image. We are copying over uh, the artifacts from a local machine. So uh, we are assuming that on our local machine, we have a folder named target, which contains a jar file. We want to copy this file into our uh, uh, custom image. Uh, and that should be the location of our file. And we want to use 
this expose command to ensure that whatever service is there in this particular jar file, or it can be a war file, etc. as well. So whatever service is there, as developers, we need to know exactly what port number we are consuming, and we have to ensure that it is exposed. So in Docker file, we have to specify the port number, which will be utilized by our application. So this command is very, very important. This will ensure that when you later on create an instance of this image, which is also known as a container, the container should be uh, able to, or uh, we should be able to connect to the service running inside this contained isolated sort of environment. The container will be self-contained, it's isolated, and uh, in order to access any functionality of that container, we have to make sure that the services are exposed like this. And then here we are starting up our application. Here, are, right now, we are assuming that we have used uh, Spring Boot to develop our application. And uh, uh, along with Java, we have used Spring Boot framework, basically. So in order to start up our service, we are using this command, cmd java minus jar. Uh, it will start up this uh, jar file. And whatever service is there in that jar file, it, it will be up and running. And since we have exposed it, it means that the service is now discoverable it can be accessed from outside the container. Even though the container is contained, it's uh, isolated, uh, but we, we can still access uh, a service running inside this container uh, by using this port number. So basically, Docker is a very important technology. We get to use Docker to create our custom Docker images. Images are sort of templates, and then we uh, create containers based on those images and so on. So this is just a brief overview of Docker. In just a bit, I'll show you Kubernetes practically. And uh, in order to understand Kubernetes, we have to first of all understand Docker. That's why I've given you a brief overview here. And microservices applications are designed for failure, which means that, like I mentioned previously, if uh, we have multiple product services or instances or replicas, if one of them goes down, then the alternate product service should be available to us. So they are designed for failure. It's uh, uh, assumed that things will fail in, uh, in real world at runtime. So that's why we have to make sure that uh, if one service goes down, then an alternate service should be available to us that we should be able to connect to and so on. Okay, so keeping this in mind that Docker allows us to create containers that are isolated sort of uh, areas uh, that contains everything that's required by that application. Now, how do you utilize Docker in such a way that if an instance or if a container has crashed or if a service has crashed, then we should still be able to access it. So even if a, a container has crashed or a service instance has crashed, we should still be able to access it. So for that, we get to use another technology which is known as Kubernetes, which I'll show you practically in just a bit. So Kubernetes, takes Docker concept to next level. And what it does is that it allows us to orchestrate the containers. So uh, container orchestration, that is what it, it is basically. And what's the meaning of container orchestration? It means that it allows us to manage the containers. For example, you can uh, group multiple containers together. So grouping of multiple related containers can be done. Uh, for this purpose, you, what, what you do is you get to create something known as a pod in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes allows you to group multiple containers by using this pod concept. So a pod is a collection of multiple related containers. So for example, if you're working on ERP sort of application, you have sales, marketing, inventory, general ledger, payroll, et cetera, and so on. They will be running in separate containers. And in order to ins uh, ensure that they are part of the same overall project or solution like ERP, we ensure that all these containers should be part of the same part. The part is composed of multiple identical containers. So for example, uh, if you have, let's say, uh, just sales for now, even if you have a single instance or a single container, you can still create a pod for it. In fact, it is uh, pretty much mandatory to always create a pod in Kubernetes, which allows you to group 
multiple related containers, even if it's uh, just a single container, you still have to create a part for it. And what it, what it does is that it will have one container inside the part. So if you have just one container inside the part, what's the benefit? The benefit is that later on you can configure auto failover, failover recovery, load balancing. And for that, you basically get to create multiple replicas of the part. Part is what you get to replicate, not the containers. Containers are not replicated. Parts are replicated. So if you say that we want to ensure there's automatic, automatic failover, load balancing, you basically get to create multiple identical parts. You just scale out your application. So you'll end up having two sales parts that will contain the identical container and so on. So a part is a collection of multiple identical uh, or related containers, and you can scale out and scale in these uh, parts. This is one of the major benefits you get out of Kubernetes. And uh, let me actually show you this practically as well. Um, let me, uh, some of these steps are fairly time consuming. So rather than showing you a live demo, I'll show you a recorded video where I'll point out all the steps. Okay, so here, uh, first of all, uh, we need to ensure that we have a Docker image available, which is all already customized. You have your application deployed in, inside that uh, image so that uh, later on you should be able to create a container based on it. So right now I'm using a ready-made image, a ready-made application, which is hosted here. I'm using Docker command to pull the image so it will download the image, which already contains the entire application um, and so on. It's just a simple sample application. So once you download this image in a more uh, in-depth sort of courses which we have, we talk about how to create these images from scratch. But I gave you a brief overview of that Docker file. That's pretty much how you do it. You basically uh, specify what base image you want to use, uh, what files you want to copy into your image and so on. And then um, here, uh, I'm using Kubernetes, and uh, to be more precise, I'm using uh, a pre-packaged solution, which is known as OpenShift. Let me give you a quick overview of OpenShift as well. So Kubernetes builds on top of Docker. And uh, definitely you can use Kubernetes uh, in sort of a standalone manner in the sense that you can download all the binaries that are required to use Kubernetes. Uh, primarily it has one main file, which is kubectl, but it also has kubeadm, it's a trend so on. There are quite a few tools that you have to use. Uh, but setting up Kubernetes can be a bit daunting because here you have to create a cluster and cluster will be composed of multiple nodes. You need to have at least one node in the cluster. The cluster overall represents the entire setup Kubernetes setup, which can be composed of just one instance or it can be comp composed of multiple instances that are running on different machines. So you need to have at least one node in your overall cluster. So setting up Kubernetes uh, from scratch can be a bit time consuming. Uh, plus uh, out of the box, it doesn't have any web user interface at all. It uh, also lacks some of the enterprise features like uh, when you have to configure more in-depth uh, service discovery and so on. There are some uh, uh, limitations and uh, to overcome these limitations, we get to use some pre-packaged solution. And there are quite a few pre-packaged solutions available. For example, uh, for simple scenarios, we can use Minikube. Minikube is an open source option which bundles up Kubernetes and on top of Kubernetes, it adds some additional features as well. So you can use uh, Minikube, but uh, its limitation is that Cluster-wise, it only lets you create a single node cluster. That's it. You cannot create multiple nodes at all. Whereas a more enterprise pre-packaged solution is known as OpenShift. This is a more professional enterprise quality sort of uh, uh, pre-packaged solution. It can let you create multiple uh, nodes in a cluster, in a configuration. You can have multiple nodes, multiple machines, and so on. So this is definitely uh, the preferred solution when it comes to using Kubernetes. So uh, both Minikube and OpenShift, they contain Kubernetes, but on top of it, they add some extra features to make things more uh, 
uh, robust um, uh, sort of more enterprise quality uh, sort, of, sort of stuff is added and so on. So here I'm using a bit of OpenShift as well. So I'm going to log in here. So I can start using the Kubernetes. And then uh, once I have uh, logged in after that, we can uh, utilize the download image. So here, here I'm able to use kubectl, which I mentioned previously that it's part of uh, Kubernetes. And OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes, so you can use all the regular commands which are supported by Kubernetes. So here I'm using this kubectl command. I'm saying that I want to create a pod based on the image, Docker image, which I downloaded previously. So I already have the Docker image downloaded previously, and I want to create, I want to start it up basically. I want to run it. So whenever you run it, you have to assign it a name. So what will happen is that it will end up creating a pod for us that will be composed of exactly one container based on this image. So one pod, one container. That's the default scenario. So we are starting up our application, and uh, once you um, execute this command, after that you can um, view your uh, deployments, which means uh, whatever images you have deployed so far. Right now I have exactly one image deployed. That's the name of my image. And uh, what it means is that we can also see uh, the pod for this image. So I can uh, execute kubectl get pods command. It will show us this pod. So a pod is basically encapsulating our container. And right now we have exactly one pod. You can see how many uh, instances you have. We have just one instance right now. It's uh, up and running, which means that whatever service is running inside that particular, or whatever service we have in, in that image, it's up and running. You can use HTTP uh, sort of command to access it. But before you'll be able to use HTTP command or uh, type in the HTTP command in your web browser or write it in some language and so on, you have to make sure that the service is exposed. The service inside the container is not automatically exposed, even though you have used the keyword expose, uh, and we have used the port number 8080 for the sample application, but it will not expose the service automatically unless and until you execute this command. This is basically going to provide us with service discovery uh, sort of feature, or, or service discovery is becoming possible of, because of this command. So this is making the service discoverable, which is inside our uh, container. So kubectl expose, we are specifying uh, what port number we want to expose it on, and so on. Uh, and uh, notice that it's possible to use a different internal port number and a different external port number. And since I want to use a bit of load balancing as well, so I've also added this type load balancer, so this will ensure that later on, you're able to create additional identical replicas of this part so that uh, you should be able to uh, see load balancing as well as auto failover in action. So internally, all this, uh, uh, we will have to use this particular port number, but uh, load balancer will utilize this port, particular port number. And actually there'll be yet another port number, which I'll show you in just a bit. But for now, the internal port number, which we have used as developers is port number 8080. Now, since we have exposed the service, you'll be able to see the exposed services like this. kubectl get services, we can see that we have a service exposed and we can see the IP address as well, which has been assigned to the container. So each container will end up having a separate IP address. So IP address is assigned to each container automatically. And uh, in order to access this particular uh, service running inside the uh, container. We can um, use the web browser or for now, I'm just going to use the curl command here in just a bit. But before that, let's see the cluster information. So cluster is basically the overall Kubernetes installation. And uh, the overall installation is currently assigned this IP address since I have just a single node sort of setup and I haven't configured any uh, separate IP addresses at all. I'm just using this local host sort of IP address for now. Let me actually speed up this video a little bit. Okay, so if you uh, access that particular uh, IP address and you use the port number which is assigned automatically, let me show you this part. Okay, so here if you look at this uh, get services command, it's showing us the service which we have exposed 
and you do not use port number 8080 at all. 8080 is used for inside the uh, Kubernetes environment, basically. It's sort of a private uh, port number, which is ac accessible only inside uh, your Kubernetes environment. Whereas for accessing it from outside Kubernetes, you will have to make a note of this particular port number, which is generated automatically. You can uh, configure it so that it's hard coded if you want. You can actually even change it to port number 8080 AT as well to make it simpler. But by default, you have to use this particular port number, which is assigned automatically. So when you use this particular port number, along with your uh, IP address, it will basically access your service. So uh, the sample application which I have in my image, it just shows the simple hello Kubernetes message along with the uh, pod name which has been assigned. The pod name wise, we have Kubernetes Bootcamp, which is a, a custom defined name, but on top of it, it's also using a bunch of numbers and letters here that are auto generated. So whenever you create a new pod in Kubernetes, it always gets assigned a unique ID like this. And if you keep on accessing the service running inside your um, pod, it will always give you the exact same message along with the exact same pod number or pod ID. Because currently we have no replicas. There's exactly one instance. And I want to show you how to implement load balancing as well as automatic failover. So notice that currently there's no auto failover. There's no uh, uh, load balancing, etc. at all. We are seeing the exact same part is servicing our request. The same part, same container is receiving all our requests right now. So there's no load balancing, there's no auto failover at all. Now how do you implement load balancing? How do you ensure that you should have multiple identical replicas of your part which can uh, host your application so that they should be load balancing and they should be auto fail automatic failover? So for that, again, if you verify how many parts you have, we have exactly one part right now. Let's uh, scale out our application. For that, we can use kubectl scale command, specify the uh, uh, Docker image, which we want to scale um, out. So here we want to create four replicas of the exact same image, which means that it will end up creating four parts where each part will have just one container for now, since I have a very simple application here. But in the real world, if you have sales, marketing, general ledger, payroll accounts, uh, sort of scenarios, uh, a part will have multiple containers, like four or five or six uh, containers and so on, depending on how many uh, microservices you have and so on. Right now, I have a single microservice, basically. So in order to scale out, we can use TTL scale command, specify how many replicas you want to create. It has scaled out our application. You can verify by getting uh, the parts list or before that you can get deployments. Uh, so we have one deployment right now and there are four uh, up and running instances of that particular application. You can see the parts. We can see four parts are available where each part contains exactly one container at this time and they're all up and running. And notice that a unique ID is assigned to each part automatically by Kubernetes. Now let's uh, experiment with the uh, load balancing. Before that, let's make a note of the IP address as well. So if you execute this command, uh, get parts minus or wide, it will show you that each part is assigned a unique IP address. So this is uh, managed by Kubernetes automatically. And next, uh, to Experiment with load balancing. Let's uh, execute this command. Curl, uh, so for now I'm using uh, the curl command line uh, sort of web browser sort of tool. It lets you uh, access any HTTP sort of uh, URL and so on. It shows you the result directly here. Otherwise you can definitely open up a web browser, type in this URL there. It will show your sample application there. Right now the sample application is very straightforward. It just shows this simple hello Kubernetes message and uh, it shows us which part serviced that request. So for the first uh, request, this is the ID of the part which fulfilled the request. If I keep on accessing my service multiple times, each time you will notice, or uh, not each time, but in most cases you will notice that the ID will be different. Like uh, if you look uh, at, at the last uh, four or five uh, letters and digits, uh, here we can see that these are different in majority of the cases. So basically, um, each service will be uh, 
uh, or most of the services will be fulfilled by a different instance of that particular part. It's managed by Kubernetes automatically. And right now we don't really have too much load. So that's why uh, in most cases it will ac access uh, one of the parts. But when you do have lots of load, that's where you will definitely see a very unique part ID each and every time. So even here you can see that for the last one, it's different. Uh, even for the first one, it's different. Uh, for uh, these two or three, it's identical, but right now we don't have too much load anyway. But still, uh, we can actually see for two to three requests, the ID is different. So load balancing is provided by Kubernetes uh, out of the box. You just have to deploy your applications and uh, just scale out your application, load balancing will be provided to us automatically. And then um, to um, test failover, you can uh, get your part list again. Each part is basically hosting at least one container right now. Otherwise, in the real world, each part can contain multiple services, like all your microservices that are related to each other, like sales, marketing, journal ledger, payroll, accounts, uh, and so on. They will be available in the same part. And each part will have the exact same containers. So here, if we get the part list, we can uh, test automatic failover by forcefully destroying a part. So I'm deleting a part forcefully, which means that the container will be destroyed for that particular part. So this command will delete the part. And uh, even though we have deleted the part, but later on, if you try to access your service, it will still work. If you try to get the part list, it will still work as well. So if I let's get the part list again, notice that it, it still starts up another part automatically since it, it, it will keep the number of parts uh, to four since that is the number of replicas we have configured at the time of uh, creation of our uh, application. Like when you deploy the application to Kubernetes, you said that you want, you want to use four replicas. So uh, the first part, we deleted that one, but after that, when you get the part list again, it will still show you four, and for the first one, not showing a different ID here. So this is one of the uh, benefits you get with Kubernetes that automatic failover and load balancing, they are available out of the box. So it keeps the number of parts uh, exactly the same the way you have configured it. So uh, you don't even have to worry about the part that got damaged or crashed, you don't have to fix it, you don't have to repair it. In case of traditional enterprise scenarios, you will say that, oh, it's a very important instance, let's fix it. Let's uh, troubleshoot, let's look at the log files, why it failed, uh, and then uh, make sure that it's up and running and so on. So here, uh, the part got damaged due to whatever reason, like there could be some exception or the, maybe the machine where the part was running, uh, maybe that crashed. Right now I have a single machine set up, but in the real world you will want to have multiple machines set up. So if that machine is crashed, uh, it doesn't matter. It will be available on some other instance. Uh, it will ensure that the number of parts is always um, equals to whatever you have configured at the time of deployment of your application. And if you access your application, it will definitely work because one of these parts will still fulfill the request and so on. So in microservices, we use the term service mesh. And one of the important uh, characteristics of service mesh is to support load balancing and um, auto failover. So Kubernetes provides these benefits to us. Okay, so any question regarding this uh, Kubernetes load balancing um, auto failover part before we talk about uh, monitoring and uh, tracing by using Prometheus Jaeger? So definitely, yes, uh, gRPC is uh, definitely getting popularity uh, because it's a uh, very lightweight, it's very fast. Uh, like I mentioned, it's uh, 25 times faster, not percent faster, times faster. Uh, it's a minor drawback is that uh, the protocol is sort of proprietary in a sense that it's not as user friendly as a REST service where you can just look at the URL, look at the payload in JSON format or like an XML, you can look at the SOAP XML, et cetera, and so on. So it's a bit more propriety sort of talk, uh, sort of area. Okay, um, then um, if I have a single microservice built using uh, Spring Boot and Cloud Foundry, all load balancing, where is the scaler? Uh, 
Exactly. So even if you are uh, deploying it um, on Cloud Foundry, uh, then definitely you'll get the same benefits as well. So Kubernetes is basically one of the technologies. Uh, and uh, when you use cloud-based solution like Azure, um, AWS, GCP, and so on, they all offer uh, a form of Kubernetes or uh, some uh, alternate solution which provides you with the similar benefits, like service sort of benefits. So you get to have the exact same benefits. Like uh, in case of uh, Azure, uh, it provides us with something known as AKS, which stands for Azure uh, Kubernetes Service, which uh, under the hood is making use of Kubernetes and provides us with the similar benefits. Uh, likewise, in case of AWS, you get to use Elastic Beanstalk. So it uh, provides us with the same features, same benefits and so on. So the term is different in uh, different uh, platforms, but uh, the end result is identical. So you can choose to use it on uh, your local environment on premises, basically. You can install Kubernetes on your local machine if you want, or you can use it in cloud as well. If uh, it doesn't uh, already offer you out of the box, it will have some other alternative available for it and fun. Okay, then uh, let's take a uh, about a 15 minute break. Let's resume at around a 12 or 20 Eastern time. After the break, I'll talk about monitoring by using uh, Prometheus and uh, by using uh, and uh, tracing by using Jaeger. And actually, we will swap the sequence of these topics. We will cover tracing first and tracing. Okay, so let's resume at 12:20. Okay, let's continue. So before the break, we discussed uh, what a microservices architecture concept is. We discussed uh, service mesh, that uh, a typical microservices architecture uh, utilizes uh, quite a few of these uh, features that are available in any service mesh. For example, um, service discovery, so for that, I talked about uh, expose keyword in Docker file script, and then we saw that how we can uh, deploy our image to uh, Kubernetes, and then we had to use a kubectl uh, expose command there to expose the service from there and so on. So basically, if you're using Kubernetes, that's how you'll do it. Otherwise, if you're using some other solution, like if you're uh, using cloud-based solutions like Cloud Foundry, Azure, AWS, GCP, they all have their own techniques as and then we also talked about uh, a typical service mesh should uh, support load balancing and failure recovery. So for that, as a case study, I used uh, Kubernetes on my side, and I showed you that uh, you can create multiple identical replicas of a pod which uh, runs a container, basically. And uh, a container means it's an application. It's a microservice. Um, and uh, if you uh, try to access that service, each time it will uh, be fulfilled by a different instance of a part. So that's basically load balancing. And if you crash a part, uh, either forcefully or if it happens on its own due to let's say machine failure or some application failure and so on, it will uh, ensure that the alternate part 
which is uh, still hosting your application should uh, fulfill the requests and so on. Okay, then uh, next uh, let's talk about uh, monitoring, tracing, uh, metrics, uh, gathering and so on. So next, uh, let's talk about tracing first, how we can trace, how we can log messages and so on. Uh, so login wise, uh, before we discuss uh, how we can implement it practically, let's talk about some of the uh, leading practices. Uh, and if you like some of these leading practices, you can say that it's your best practice. You'll want to follow it. Um, in, other, in other words, we can say these are the best practices used by quite a few uh, organizations. So usually when you log your messages for the sake of troubleshooting, each request which you're sending from the client to your server or service should be ideally logged so that you know exactly which service had the issue, et cetera, and so on. Uh, and uh, when you uh, send these uh, logs or when you uh, want to write these logs, ideally for each request, we should have a unique ID. So quite often we use some uh, universally unique um, identifier or a globally unique identifier sort of value so that uh, we can uh, correlate it uh, later on and so on. Okay, so uh, request should have the ID and when the ser service fulfills the request and uh, it sends a response back to the client, ideally we should have the same ID there as well. So this way you can correlate, okay, this is the request, this is the response and uh, maybe we uh, encountered some issue when it was processed by the server, maybe database server was down or some depend, dependent service was down, like uh, your product service could try to connect to inventory service and so on, so maybe it, uh, that service is down and so on, or whatever the case might be, maybe the UR is invalid. Um, so basically, you, you should be able to correlate, the, correlate these. So both the request and the response should utilize some common ID for the sake of correlation. And then um, send locks to a central location. This is exactly what we're going to discuss in detail. So basically all the logs, ideally they should be kept in three different places. We should send all these logs to a common sort of service, which should uh, be capable of receiving the logs and it should be able to retain these logs and so on. Uh, let me actually draw it here. So say we have multiple services. Uh, they don't have to be just the backend services, they can be the uh, front-end sort of uh, applications as well. So say we have some uh, front-end application, we have let's say the backend uh, service here, let's say it's just a simple login service. So when you're sending a request to your server and it uh, fulfills the request and responds you back with it, um, ideally we should log messages. So logging wise, this will be running in a different container. This will be running in a separate container. So ideally we should have another container which is also known as a sidecar as well. Uh, quite often we call it envoy or a, a envoy sidecar. Sidecar means there are some services that will be used by pretty much all other, other services. So for example, your uh, front end, uh, your back end sort of services, they want to log messages. So for that they need a common sort of a container where we should have some uh, logging sort of service running. So for example, here we will end up using something called Jaeger. So Jaeger is a very commonly used open source uh, uh, distributed tracing sort of a library or sort of a framework which allows you to record messages from uh, different machines, different containers, different services, uh, and so on. So basically it's a sidecar sort of container. Sidecar means that it will be used by pretty much all the containers. So it's a sort of a reusable, not exactly reusable, but something that that's, that should be available to multiple containers. It's sort of a common container. So uh, for tracing purpose, Jaeger is a very commonly used solution. And later on, I'll talk about some more options as well. Okay, so basically uh, all these containers where we have our microservices running, they will want to log messages, messages to, uh, to the central location. So Jaeger, which is uh, one of the very useful uh, distributed tracing solutions. It's uh, going to act as a central logging solution where we're going to log the messages. 
I'll show you this practically in just a bit. Uh, before that, let me go back here. So basically, we will uh, end up configuring a sidecar container for it. Again, sidecar basically means it's something that will be used by the majority of the containers. Okay, so uh, this is one of the common practices you uh, want to use a central location. Uh, or let me actually show you a practical demo for this one before I show you some more details. Okay, so how do we use uh, Jaeger as a, a distributed tracing solution, which lets you log messages from various locations, from various con containers, or from various virtual machines, or, or from uh, cloud as well, and so on. So let me show you this practically. For that, let me go to my virtual machine here. For Kubernetes, I, uh, I had to show you uh, a recorded video because some of the steps, they are quite time consuming, but uh, uh, tra tracing with Jaeger is fast enough. So I'll just quickly show you a, a live demo here. Let me go to my sample project here. Okay, so here I already have a sample application. I've already configured it. I've written the code as well, uh, so that it can connect to uh, Jaeger, which is basically a distributed tracing uh, solution. You have to inst uh, run it either on a physical machine where you have some operating system installed. You can run it uh, on top of that operating system, or you can set up a separate virtual machine for it, or you can have it configured in a Docker container. So here, since we are talking about on-premises implementation of microservices for now, uh, we are using Kubernetes to ensure that it offers load balancing and auto failover and so on. Uh, likewise, we are going to set up uh, Jaeger in a separate Docker container. Ideally, that should also be running as a pod in Kubernetes, but for now, I'm using a different virtual machine where I don't have Kubernetes installed. So I'll just uh, utilize Docker container concept to start up a Jaeger service. So before I start up uh, the service, let me just quickly show you the code as well. So here, first of, first of all, let me show you this uh, controller where I've uh, written a bit of code so that I can uh, record messages to my um, Jaeger uh, distributed tracing solution. So for that, I've added these uh, import statements and actually I'll show you the palm.xml file to show you the dependency which you have to add in order to make sure that you're able to connect to Jaeger in just a bit. But uh, in short, you have to import these uh, uh, packages here uh, and then you have to write the code. So for example, here I have a simple controller uh, which is going to act as a REST service. So whenever we type in just the slash as part of the URL, like localhost colon port number, uh, which is 8080 by default, slash, when I type this URL, and the method is get, then uh, before we perform the actual operation, which is supposed to be uh, this one, which should get the list of employees and return all the employees. So before that, I want to make sure that we log some messages to our uh, distributed tracing solution, which is Jaeger in this case. So for that, I'm using uh, these classes, pan, and then uh, I'm uh, recording a custom message here. So this will show up in Jaeger, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so this will show up in Jaeger, uh, each time you make this uh, uh, get method based call, it will show up this um, particular message. And ideally, we should also uh, generate some globally unique identifier so that uh, it should be sent as part of your, uh, uh, or it should be received here, and we should uh, record it to our uh, logging solution and so on, so that you can trace it back to your uh, requests and so on. So for now, I'm not doing that. And uh, once you are done performing your actual operation, you basically uh, just execute this finish function. It will uh, let your distributed tracing solution know that you are done recording the message. Uh, and uh, you can add as many messages here as you want. These are all custom tags. These are sort of labels or tags which you're assigning to your messages. So here we want to say that uh, this request is fulfilled successfully. If you are uh, choosing to store this uh, status code 201, so you must have seen that uh, status code 200 means uh, everything was successful. 400 means there's a client side error. 500 means there's a server side error. 300 means there's a service uh, or URL redirect. Uh, the URL is no longer valid. You, it will basically redirect you to the valid URL and so on. Um, so basically, uh, we, have, we have to write just a few lines of code in order to make sure that we are able to uh, log messages. And uh, 
when we run this application, so it's a Maven, uh, so I'm using a Maven as the build engine. And uh, I've used a Spring Boot framework. So we don't need any application server at all. We can start it up like this. So let's start, it's on built-in uh, application server. The application will be hosted. Ideally, it should be in, in a container. So we should deploy to Kubernetes the way I discussed previously. But uh, here, I just want to focus on Jaeger for now. So Jaeger is a distributed tracing solution. So even when you use a Docker container and so on, your application will be running inside a container like this. It will have its own application server. You don't need any other application server, etc. at all. It's a self-contained application and it starts up on its own as well. So once your application is up and running, before I show you Jaeger, let me just uh, quickly show you this output of my simple service here. It just returns simple uh, JSON uh, data, JavaScript object notation, basically. Okay, so this is the default uh, URL, and then uh, my service name is employees, and just uh, the slash, it will use get method. We can see this uh, simple JSON data here. So basically, it's a very simple uh, output right now, but more importantly, we have to see the tracing part. We have logged the request that we have received the request and we are fulf fulfilling the request. So for that, you have to start up Jaeger. So for Jaeger, let me open up another terminal. Ideally, we should uh, create a, um, a container and it should be de deployed to uh, Kubernetes so that uh, we can support or um, ensure that load balancing and automatic failover should be available to Jaeger container as well. But for now, I don't have Kubernetes inst installed or configured on this particular mach uh, virtual machine. So I'll uh, just uh, start up Jaeger in a simple container without using Kubernetes. Let me increase the font size first. Okay, so here we can uh, use uh, Docker only without using Kubernetes, run uh, the container. And uh, before I run this command, let me actually show you that uh, I do have uh, quite a few images here. Docker images, but uh, and I also have uh, a Jaeger instance as well, but it's not up and running by default. So I do have quite a few instant, uh, images here, like uh, I have a uh, Jaeger tracing. This is the actual image name. It's already available on my machine, but I don't have a running instance of it. So for, let's say I try to get the list of up and running images or uh, in, uh, containers by using, let's say, grep, Jaeger, I don't have any up and running instance of Jaeger at all. So let's uh, start up uh, a Jaeger container. So basically, uh, you can definitely install Jaeger on your machine, but issue with that would be, it will end up using various folders. So it will not be a self-contained sort of solution. Whereas when you use Docker, it will let you create a container that will be self-contained. Every dependency will be in, inside that container already. So it's a portable, uh, isolated, uh, self-contained uh, sort of technology. So let's uh, create a Jaeger instance, Docker run. We want to run it as a daemon or a, in the background, basically. That should be the name of our custom container. Uh, I want to use uh, this image template, which I'll specify in just a bit. And I want to use a custom host name as well. Jaeger tracing, this is the name of my image. I think I'll be using 1.1.12. Or 12. I should have uh, removed this one. Let me double check the image name. GV tracing all in one, one dot four. Um, for some 
is an interesting thing that doesn't exist. What's the motion? J bar J E G E R. There's a typo. Okay, that's more like it. So we have uh, a container, most likely. Let's verify. Grab Jaeger. Okay, so yes, we have the Jaeger instance up and running. And uh, we have already configured our application. We have written some code here as well, which will allow the application to send messages to uh, this uh, Jaeger. And Jaeger will be able to detect these uh, requests, etc. as well. Uh, so let's start up Jaeger. So for uh, Jaeger, it's a web-based web tool. It's uh, definitely a service, plus it's also a web-based tool. Service runs in the background, and to interact with the service, we could use the web interface. And the default port number for Jaeger is localhost colon 8080 is obviously just for Spring Boot right now. I think it's 16, I have it here. So that's the default port number used by Jaeger. It takes about uh, a minute or so once you start it up for the first time before it's able to recognize uh, other services and so on. So for example, for now, let's say just uh, access the service one more time after I've started up Jaeger. And then uh, here I can verify the services. Currently no services found. So we have to wait for it a bit before it will be able to detect these services. It takes almost up to a minute or so before it shows up the services. So right now it's showing uh, one of the sample or out of the box services, Jaeger query, which you can use in advanced cases to query various uh, re uh, traces, various uh, requests and responses, etc., and so on. So for now I want to wait for my custom service to show up, which will take almost a minute or so. So tracing wise, uh, if you guys have used, uh, let's say, uh, Zipkin, which is another very useful uh, tool, uh, Zipkin is more popular with Netflix open source software, uh, network um, uh, stack or a uh, Netflix stack basically. So if you use Zipkin, even that does pretty much the same thing. Like it can show you the entire trace. If a microservice calls another microservice and that microservice calls yet another one. So if it's a nested, deeply changed, chained sort of uh, call, it can show you the entire trace. So which microservice called what other service and what was the network latency, how long it took to fulfill the request, et cetera, and so on. It can show you the entire trace, basically. That is a distributed tracing solution. So I have to wait for a few more seconds before it shows my custom application here, and then we'll be able to uh, see more details, like uh, how many requests we have uh, sent from, or uh, it has received uh, when it fulfilled the request, and so on whether there was an issue or not, so all that stuff will be available. Okay, so let's uh, wait for it to show up. In the meanwhile, let me uh, discuss a couple of more uh, theoretical sort of topics uh, while it's still uh, getting loaded. So usually in the real world, obviously you're uh, Jaeger service will be up and running, and uh, after that you will start up other services and so on. So they usually get picked up much faster. But here I had to start uh, Jaeger just now, so obviously it will take a bit of time before it's able to recognize uh, my custom services and so on. Okay, so while it's uh, still uh, loading the services, let me discuss a couple of more concepts here. Okay, so basically, um, uh, Jaeger is going to act as a, a sort of a central location which can capture services from multiple containers. So it's a distributed tracing solution which is installed on just one machine. On a, or a, in, a, in this case, we had to use just a single container. So that's where it's running. But it's, it will be capable of capturing the request from uh, pretty much your entire solution. As long as you have configured your applications, so that they can uh, send the uh, requests or uh, the data to your uh, Jaeger installation. So um, ideally we should definitely have Jaeger configured in one of the containers so that uh, all services should be able to send the data to it. 
And then uh, we should also try to structure the log data as well. So structure wise, basically we should uh, record as much useful information as possible. So for example, as part of your logs, you'll want to record date and timestamp, exception messages. Uh, what's the service name? What's the URL? Uh, what's the uh, API level information, for example, what operation you uh, performed? Was it get method, post method, put method, delete method? What JSON data you sent? Uh, you should also uh, store the status code as well, your network addresses like the source and target IP address and so on. Uh, even uh, client information like let's say username, not the password, but uh, username, uh, user ID, etc., can be recorded as well. So ideally we should record uh, at least this sort of data so that we can make sense of what's the issue, uh, why we have logged the message, et cetera, and so on. Okay, so let me come back to this one. Let's see if it's uh, loaded. Okay, so it's still uh, working. Let me run this one a couple of more times so it can uh, speed things up a little bit. Okay, so finally here we can see this um, custom uh, service here. I've named it Jaeger Tutorial in my Spring Boot based application. So here if, uh, if you click on this one, you can uh, specify what operations you want to view. Uh, and operations wise, if you recall in my code, I had marked it as uh, this one. So get employees in my get method, this is the custom name which I assigned to it. It's sort of a custom label which we have assigned to it. Uh, you can also specify the time period as well. Uh, can specify uh, more f filters here. Uh, if I click this find traces, it will show me all the traces here. So uh, this particular uh, service has been accessed once so far since uh, it has rec uh, so since uh, this Jaeger service has recognized our custom service since then there has been two traces. So you can see uh, when exactly they occurred. You can hover the mouse over it. It's telling us that we performed the get employees operation. You can click on it to see more details as well. And right now we have just a, a simple get method here. Uh, in real world, you will definitely have nested chain uh, sort of uh, calls. One microservice will call another microservice that will call yet another microservice that will call yet another microservice. So you can see the entire trace here and you can see how long it took to fulfill the request. Uh, what was the latency, uh, et cetera, and so on. You can see all that information here. So right now we are able to see the tags, the custom data, et cetera. Uh, it's all available here. So it's a very useful uh, distributed tracing solution. You can use it for the sake of uh, troubleshooting issues like why, which uh, portion of your microservice application is slow, which we should fine tune further and so on. So you can see uh, useful information like that here. Okay, so any question regarding this uh, distributed tracing by using Jaeger? So ideally, it should be con uh, configured in a separate container and that's considered as a sidecar which means that it's a, a, a something which will be utilized by pretty much all uh, the remaining containers or your remaining microservices, et cetera, and so on. And uh, likewise, you can uh, configure something else as well, which is called Prometheus. Prometheus is meant for monitoring and uh, metrics. Thing. Like uh, say you want to find out uh, what's the CPU utilization of your application, uh, RAM consumption, the number of requests, that you have received so far. Um, so uh, this sort of information can be captured. Uh, likewise, uh, how many failed requests are there? How many successful requests are there? You can choose to capture this sort of information by using yet another tool called uh, uh, Prometheus. First of all, let me quickly show you service mesh slide. So basically a service mesh should support monitoring and metrics uh, gathering as well. So for this part, you can uh, use various uh, solutions. Uh, one of the solutions is, to, uh, is uh, Prometheus. Um, so Prometheus wise, let me quickly configure this one as well. So we don't have too much time. Let me quickly stop this application and uh, configure Prometheus for that. I'll also have to 
shut down my other uh, instance or let me just run that one as well okay so configuration wise i think most of the stuff is configured i just have to start up my new tab here and in the new tab i can run uh, prometheus uh, before that i'll have to definitely ensure that my ip address is configured properly in my configuration Okay, so I should be able to use this particular port number or uh, IP address. And then uh, let me configure Prometheus. So in the detailed course, uh, or the in-depth course, we talk about um, these things in more detail. So now I'm just going to configure for this thing. Start read-only file. Okay, so this is where my application is running. I just obtained the IP address. Uh, ignore this INET part. And then uh, next I have to start up my uh, Prometheus uh, uh, container. So again, Prometheus will act as a sidecar container, which should be available to the rest of the microservices and so on. So let me start up uh, Prometheus here. I want to perform port binding here. And I need to configure the location of my configuration file as well. And inside my uh, Docker image, I want to make sure that it's bound to, or uh, mapped to this particular folder. Yes, it has to be the exact same location, otherwise Prometheus will not be able to pick it up. It's ATC slash Prometheus. Okay, so um, this command should uh, start up another container for us. That should uh, have Prometheus config.file. Should have been okay. Uh, otherwise, let me just uh, save a bit of time, just copy it from my machine. Okay, so this should uh, start up uh, a container for us. We should have uh, Prometheus up and running. That was much faster. Okay, so uh, once we have Prometheus up and running, let's uh, ensure that it's, uh, it is up and running. So Docker PS minus A grab Prometheus. So yes, uh, we have Prometheus up and running. And then we can uh, use uh, the port number which we have configured here. I think it's 1990. So let's open up uh, another page. So Prometheus is yet another service uh, which has this front end to interact with that, that service and it, it will be able to use a Spring Boot actuator concept. Uh, if you guys have, uh, if, if you develop uh, applications by using Spring Boot framework, you might have heard of actuators in Spring Boot. Actuators are basically uh, some metrics, some extra properties of your application which are exposed for example, here I have this application um, hosted uh, 
uh, at port number 8080. My service name is employees. So this is the service which I previously sh showed you. Uh, uh, let me actually start it up again. <clears throat> so uh, whenever you create a, a Spring Boot based application, you have the option to add a Spring Boot actuator dependency to your palm.xml file, which will expose some of the metrics. You'll be able to view some of the useful information, which is uh, exposed uh, from your uh, Spring Boot application. Uh, what exact information is, is exposed? Let me show you that here. So whatever your URL is, which is used to access your application, you just use actuator. slash actuator. You have to add um, actuator uh, dependency to your palm.xml file, which I'll show you in just a bit. So basically, uh, actuator is telling us that there are some extra uh, metrics that are available to us, which we can utilize for the sake of monitoring our application and so on. And if you keep on going through this list, eventually it will show you Prometheus as well, since we have already configured Prometheus uh, in our application and we have it up and running as well. So now we can type in actuator slash Prometheus to access uh, these uh, details. So if I type in uh, Prometheus here, we can see uh, Prometheus specific metrics that are available uh, to any Spring Boot application or the other way around. Whatever Spring Boot application we have, it's a uh, matrix will be available to our Prometheus setup. Uh, so here we can make a lot of uh, these important uh, settings. For example, we have, uh, let's say, uh, CPU utilization. We have uh, lots of other options as well. And uh, again, to save a bit of time, let me just copy these long URLs from here. So you can, uh, let's say, access uh, the process uptime, uh, how long, for how long your ser uh, service has been up and running. You can see the CPU utilization. You can see... Uh, how many requests failed, how many requests succeeded based on the status code and so on. So for that, you can go back to your uh, Prometheus page, which is uh, available on port number 1990. That's the one. Uh, so here you can enter uh, the metrics here. So we'd want to get the process uptime. So again, this will take a bit of time before it gets initialized. Uh, so once it's initialized and you execute, so if you uh, go back to this actuator slash Prometheus, you can see what metrics are available to us. So you can go through this huge list of uh, metrics. I here it will show you some very useful ones. For example, uh, how many times we have encountered status code 200 when we made get method call. So you can copy this particular thing as it is. Likewise, if you want to change the method to post, uh, put, delete, and so on, you can definitely do that. It will show you the count of methods, how many times you encountered this, this type of call, which resulted in a successful sort of a fulfillment of the request, or it uh, resulted in a failed uh, fulfillment, et cetera, and so on. So you can copy these metrics, you can enter them here, click execute, it will show you a graph here. The graph will show you how how many times you have encountered successful requests, uh, failed requests, and so on. Or in this case, if you just execute process uptime second, if you click execute, it will show you a graph which will show you for how long your service has been up and running. But again, this does take a bit of time to sort of warm up. Uh, but eventually, once it's uh, warmed up, when it's uh, completely loaded, it will start showing you a graph here uh, and so on. So uh, Prometheus is basically a monitoring tool. It lets you uh, visualize some of the uh, metrics which are uh, available out of the box because of Spring Boot actuator concept. Uh, but to add more uh, actuators or more uh, details, more metrics, we utilize Prometheus on top of it. So in your palm.xml file, you basically have to add this uh, actuator first. So let's say if I open up this palm.xml file, you have to uh, ensure that you have added this uh, actuator. So Spring Boot Actuator, and also to ensure that you're able to expose some uh, additional useful uh, metrics, you have to add this uh, Prometheus dependency as well to your uh, project. And um, Prometheus is definitely very useful, uh, but its graph is very bare bones sort of graph out of the box. To make the graph more uh, useful, to visualize the data in uh, different types of uh, charts and so on, you can uh, extend it further by using another tool called Grafana. 
So Grafana is mentioned in the slides as well. All these slides will be uploaded later on along with uh, the video recording of the session as well. Here I've already mentioned it that you can utilize Grafana on top of uh, Prometheus. It will basically show you even fancier uh, graphs. You can uh, use it as sort of a dashboard as well if you want and so on. Uh, and Grafana can actually also pull in the data from ELK as well. So if you guys do use uh, ELK stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and so on, so, um, from the Logstash, it can pull in the data as well if you want. So some people prefer using Grafana to pull in the data uh, from every sort of source and visualize that in Grafana. Other people prefer using ELK for that purpose. So have a pick, you can use pretty much uh, any solution. But uh, at, uh, at least use Prometheus so that you can at least have the metrics exposed and uh, out of the box it does have at least uh, some basic charts available which you can use to monitor your application and so on. So both uh, Jaeger and uh, Prometheus will act as side cards. So they will be running in separate containers and they will be available to all our microservices and so on. Uh, and even if you're using uh, Cloud Foundry or Azure or AWS or GCP, et cetera, and so on, even there, um, you can utilize these concepts as well. Okay, so any question regarding this uh, uh, session? Okay, so a video recording will be made available. It will be uploaded along with the slides as well. So this is just a a basic um, overview. Uh, in the in-depth course, we cover all these practically uh, in more detail, um, and we covered lots of ad additional technologies as well and so on. Okay, so thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure to be here with you for two, uh, uh, these couple of hours.